everyone. My name is Hagen Sun. I'm president of Your Club of Beijing. And with that, I'd like to introduce my colleague, uh, Julia Zhu. Uh, Julia is um, our club advisor, MBA 98. And today, um, her family is here. Um, her husband, uh, Tom Jin, MBA 98. And uh, their son, Jerry, is here. Welcome. Uh, um, it's a pleasure for us to welcome everyone here, and especially welcome uh, Matthew Brown. And today, Mr. Brown will talk about uh, the making classical ballet. And uh, your current student, uh, Li Lin, will host the ballet. Then I'd like to thank your center for hosting this event and thank Li Jing for helping us invite Mr. Wang. Your club has a lot of attractive events in the future. Um, if you want to learn more about it, please subscribe to our newsletter on yourclubofbeijing.net or scan the QR code on the banner. Uh, our upcoming events include uh, a talk on education by Wang Fan, a PhD in PhD 99. Uh, he's, a, he's a founder of uh, Little Oak Children's House. And uh, we also have uh, a talk on North Korea by uh, Colombian historian uh, Charles Armstrong and uh, a talk by Hong Xiaowen. Senior Vice President of Microsoft. Uh, we also hold uh, happy hours every month on the last Thursday at Sunnington. We welcome everyone to join us, uh, make new friends, and uh, meet alumni. Mm. So uh, now let's get started. Uh, I'll pass on to Sunnington to introduce uh, the guest speaker. Good evening, everyone. My name is Serene Li, uh, Li Siling. I'm a current undergraduate student at Yale University, a rising senior majoring in global affairs and music. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to Yale Center Beijing, Yale University's home in China, in Beijing. Um, the center opened um, on October the 27th, 2014, and in the past little more than a year and a half, we have successfully hosted almost 200 events. Um, and our guest tonight, I know a lot of us, here already his fans, is a five-time Laurence Olivier Award winner and the only Tony Award winner who won um, for Best Choreographer and Best Director of a Musical. So why don't we first take a look at some of his most well-known work.
Right, so ever since the, um, his male version of Swan Lake, probably some of you here know, um, know about it, um, his ballet production has definitely been winning hearts of thousands around the world for the past two decades. Um, and soon enough, he'll be bringing his new and very gothic Sleeping Beauty um, to meet with his Beijing audience in September. And tonight, we're more than lucky to have him here with us to share um, the little-known um, stories behind the productions, his insights um, into music, um, into arts, ballet, and business, and of course, his secrets to success. So please welcome Sir Matthew Ward. strands of my work there. The, the last couple, two clips were musical theatre, obviously, uh, which is my kind of sideline, the thing I do on the side. I work for Cameron McIntosh, the, the uh, incredibly wealthy producer um, of musicals, the world famous uh, uh, producer. And Oliver, that was Oliver and Mary Poppins. I've also done uh, My Fair Lady with him as well. Um, so that's my, the other side of what I do. All the previous clips before that were from uh, my own company, my own dance theatre company called New Adventures. And we are um, a, we would describe ourselves as a contemporary dance theatre company. And although the, some of the pieces that we do are famous ballets, you know, so we're not really a ballet company, not really a classical ballet company, we're not classical at all. We don't even do point work. But we, we do a, a strange combination of, of um, theatre, and dance and acting and uh, mime and uh, people say it is a bit like musical theatre but without the words. Um, so it's a it's a it's a it's an own genre of theatre in a way. And the, the company's been going for 30 years next year. Um, and the piece that we're bringing here, Secret Beauty, is my most recent piece. And that was premiered for our 25th anniversary about four years ago. So. Um, very excited to be here and to be able to introduce this work to you. Your company will also be, yeah, how many of them are coming? All of them. <laughs> All of them? <laughs> yes. That's great. Um, so what, what does the process of your creation look like? How, how does it come from a, a small idea to the whole production on stage? Well, it's, um, it starts with something I, could, what I call the, the big idea. What is the big idea about this production? And that could be, it could be male swans in Swan Lake, for example. That's the big idea. And that may be all the idea is at that point. You know, that may be the only thing that's different about it. And then we would develop on that. Or it could be my production of Cinderella is set during the London Blitz. And the, the idea of that is the London Blitz, the Second World War, was when people went missing. Um, Cinderella goes missing, you know, the prince can't find her. So it seemed to be a sort of great era in which to set it. But at, the, at that point, it's just that one idea. And then, if I think that idea is a good idea, then I start to elaborate on that idea and try and write a story and do a lot of research into other versions of that story, other productions, maybe other films, whatever it may be. Do a lot of research, decide what era I'm setting it in, and Anything about it really that I can, um, any kind of research that I could bring to it. And then the next person I would get involved would be the designer of virtually all those pieces for Les Bunsen. Um, and then he, I'd start to shape it with him in terms of how it's going to look, um, what the uh, costumes might be, what the places it's going to go to in the piece, literally. Um, and together we would develop. Uh, a scenario, and he would design the whole piece before we go into rehearsals. And I may then do some workshops with a small, loyal group of dancers who I like working with, just four or five, maybe something like that, and we'd start to develop movement ideas. Um, and this can take a long period of time, it could be two years, 
18 months, something like that. But the actual rehearsal with the full company is very intense and brief. Due to finance, actually. <laughs> because when you're rehearsing, it's all outgoing and no incoming. So it's expensive time for a company. So we, when I did Swan Lake 20 years ago, I may have had about eight or nine weeks to make that. Uh, now, I have six weeks to make a new piece. Way too short. It's very, and that, that's more than we have for a your Reviver piece, it's four weeks. So, um, I have to be very organized, I have to know exactly what I'm doing as much as possible. I still leave a bit of freedom for creative spirit amongst the company and, and new ideas and keep my ears and eyes open, you know, because I, I also I don't have all the answers, so it's true. Um, so, it's a, a long process, but then gets very intense at the end. Yeah, it sounds to me like a lot of cooperation. So you, you, you tell someone yeah. your idea, and your designer comes in to work with you, and um, a lot of cooperation, of course, with those four weeks or six weeks with yeah. you and, and the rest of you and your dancers. So, um, are there any situations happen that there's a disagreement of ideas? So, do they inspire you in many ways? Um, they know I'm there to make the final decision. You know, so I'm, that's my job. Of course. <laughs> um, my job is, you know, to be the person who goes, we're going to do that idea, and maybe not that one. You know, so or that, that's that's what the director does. You know, um, so, so there's no real conflict because there's an understanding there. Um, I'm not someone who gets angry as well in front of people. I don't ever show any anger. I'm a nice person to work with. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very nice to work with. I, don't, I, mean, I, I'm, I like to create an atmosphere in which everyone feels happy working and it feels happy and co confident to suggest ideas. So that, because I might miss a great idea if I don't make that possible in the room. So uh, I like to create an atmosphere where everyone can contribute something. And I, it's good if you make people feel they've contributed as well. Because then the piece becomes about them as well. It becomes something that they can say to their friends. Oh, I did that bit. Well, I think that was my idea. And they feel very proud. And it's good to have ownership of the work you're doing. Yeah, and then they look natural in, yeah. in what they are yeah, saying yeah. to do. And, um, I mean, obviously, the, the ballet theatre is definitely different from a, a film making where there's a script beforehand. So, um, so, so which part comes in first? Do you have the idea and you have like a general narrative? Then you have designer, or does it go in the same time with your um, dancing rehearsal? Um, well, it's like I said, you know, they, I have to have done all the work in advance before it starts because because of the timing of things that all the sets are already being built and the costumes are being made before we've even made that many steps. Oh, really? So it has to be. Uh, you have to. That's how planned you have to be because if the, if the set wasn't starting to be built before six weeks, you know, we wouldn't do it in time. We often like to rehearse on the set as well, so that we can really use it. So, um, it's uh, the, a lot of decisions have to have been made in advance. So you try and get a balance right of decisions that have been made, and then a lot of room for uh, changes if you need, to need them. And I, pieces that never, uh, never end up as I imagine them in my head, they're always different. Different because you're also not the only person making decisions, but also like the dancers get to say that yes. I want to move this way or that way. Yes. That's the interesting part, which is the, the new things in your work, the new elements, the surprising things. So how do they come about? Like the changes, why? Why, why do the changes? <laughs> well, in terms of a, the piece you mean, and we're talking the story. Yeah, it's been interesting. I've been asked a lot while I've been here. How do you make up stories? You know, that's it. What seems like doing that? That seems like the hard part. That is I think the hard that's part. the easy part. Oh. That's the part I find the most um, because it's just me thinking about things on my own. You know, I'm working out a story. I'm creating characters. Um, I'm doing a lot of research. I'm making nice discoveries and things. The hard part is the movement. You know, the panic at <laughs> the end. Uh, that's the hard part. But the actual. Um, uh, creating of a story is I use my imagination, and it's my imagination. Um, and so other people find it, how do you do, how do you, how do you come up with that idea? That seems crazy. To me it doesn't seem so crazy. 
<laughs> and then I would think the same as somebody else's ideas. Wow, they're amazing. How did they think of that? But it's because it's come from them, you know. So, um, but how I'd approach a story uh, would be to try and give it some sort of contemporary uh, relevance, and some, or some sort of um, uh, cultural references and things that I think can, uh, modern audiences will, will understand. And I come from a world of ballet where um, uh, those things are long forgotten a long time ago. People forgot what these mime, the mimes mean, and um, the story is so accepted that everyone knows it, but I don't think sometimes they tr we try hard enough to get the story across. Or you have to have read it beforehand before you see it in a program. And I don't believe in that. You see, I believe that you don't, you shouldn't read the story before you see it. Um, some people get upset about this, you know, why can't I read this, the scenario, you know, they feel they're not going to be able to follow it. So I, I don't have stories, scenarios in my program. I, I expect people to follow it. So I, the story, how crazy the story is, and they get it, and that's yeah. the amazing part. Well, I wouldn't do it if, I, if it was going to be too confusing, you know, I do things that I think people can follow. It's not easy, though, I have to say that, it's, you have to think about it, you have to, you know, Decide for yourself what's going on here. What what the, uh, what you think people are thinking? You know, yeah. that's really uh, an important part of uh, entering into this experience. It's not so it's not straightforward. So, for example, with with um, Swan Lake, mm. um, how did the audience first react to it uh, more than two decades ago? Do they follow? Did they get what you wanted to say? Well, it's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Swan Lake's so famous, you know, and when I made it, I wasn't that famous. I was sort of um, a bit of an upstart, you know, and some of the people were thinking, I'd announced we were doing Swan Lake, and I'd also announced we were doing it with male, male swans. So half the people were saying to me, oh, it's going to be so funny, or Swan Lake, it's going to be hilarious, you know, they were thinking it was going to be a, a comedy to send up, you know. And the other people were saying, you know, uh, you know it's a tragedy, you know, you, you can't mess with it, you know, it's serious. So everyone's worried about that. A lot of people were thinking it was um, going to be men in drag. You know, a lot of people thought, when I said male swans, they, I think they imagined men in tutus. <laughs> um, you know, headdress, point shoes, like the trocks. Have you ever had the trocks here? No? They're a sort of drag <laughs> ballet company anyway. Don't, don't worry about them. Um, <laughs> um, uh, so that's what people were, some people imagine that. What nobody could imagine was what a male dancing swan might look like. That, that it, was, it was just male swans. And this revelation that there are female swans and male swans seemed to be a big deal. Because, um, and if there were no male swans, there wouldn't be any swans. Would there? <laughs> and, uh, after a while, if it was all female, they would die off. Anyway. <laughs> Very true. So, um, so the big surprise of the evening when people saw the first show was when the swans came on, when uh, Adam Cooper, who was our original swan, came on, uh, was a bit shocked. And they were shocked in a different way. They were shocked because it wasn't what they were expecting. And it suddenly turned very serious and mysterious. And sort of, uh, there was a wildness to these swans. And it, people were more shocked that it sort of worked and it had this amazing effect on the first audience, you know, um, due to not expecting it. You know, nobody could imagine what it was. And the next day in the press was lots of pictures of, you know, Margaret Fontaine, our most famous ballerina, as a swan. Next to Adam Cooper, these two pictures of the female swan and the male swan. And that was like a big contrast. Was about. Yeah. And um, it. I mean, also, the other thing to say about it, at the beginning, they were, some people were shocked by it a little bit. Two men dancing together was a problem for some people. Some people <laughs> walked out, you know. Um, we had lots of little girls in tears, uh, in their bums, you know, sort of, they, knew they weren't seeing the swan lake they wanted, but they knew. We had a little bit of that on the first tour. And, um, you know, it was sort of a little bit controversial, but mostly people really liked it, actually. It was even very old ballerinas were sort of enjoying it. Um, but uh, it's interesting that we did have people walking out 
the stuff. And now it's a, it's seen to be a, a, almost like a family show back home in London. And people bring their families at Christmas. And it's all <laughs> over Christmas, you know, it's sort of not seen as controversial at all. And a lot of young people have only seen the male swans, and they think it's odd that female dancers play swans. It's called a turn right around. Yes, but Hed, I mean, I personally love it because I feel like you're bringing out the more mysterious and, and somehow more genuine side of the swans, like the freedom they portray in and the strength. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, I thought there was something interesting in the final act, actually. The final act for me, I, I love the ballet, I love the classical ballet as well. I do, when it's good, I really enjoy it. It's not always it's good. good, not always good. Um, but I, I do like it, I do love it. Um, but the end is always a little bit disappointing, it doesn't live up to the music. And the music, Tchaikovsky's music in Act 4 is quite violent, quite overwhelming, dramatic and powerful. So I thought if we really genuinely had the swans attacking, um, then uh, we could do something with that music and really live up to the music. And that's what we did, and people found that very uh, exciting, I guess. And that was where we were talking earlier about the bird, Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds. Yes, yeah. You know this film? Yes. Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds, where the birds all attack <laughs> people for no reason. Well, that was the inspiration for my spot laid, you know, it was uh, Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised to hear that people were like, what? Got this idea? That's, yeah, that's really astonishing. So what about um, Sleeping Beauty, then? Anything fun that happened in the... Well, the creation of that has been... Uh, and in a different story to what I said earlier, I kind of was put off doing it for many years because although I love the music, it seemed very grand and very, um, uh, almost again, quite overwhelming, but it was a story about princes, princesses and princes and kings and queens again. I felt I'd done that a bit. <laughs> and um, so I kept putting it off. So there's a long gap between Swan Lake and the Secret of Music, 16 years or something. Um, and it, with this one, I didn't know what the big idea was, and I, I kind of made myself do it. I said, right, we're, we're definitely going to do it, and I'm going to really work on it to try and find a way of doing it. So I looked at it from the point of view of what do I, what do I not like about it? Um, and um, I didn't think the love story was good. I didn't think the... Uh, I didn't like Prince coming into it so late and just kissing, <laughs> kissing her and we're in love. You know, so I think that was very interesting. Um, I, I felt that the, um, uh, the good versus evil story was uh, not kept going through the piece. I thought it needed more tension all the way through the piece. The story needed a bit more excitement and more plot, really. Um, so, I, you know, I invented new characters. I've invented a, 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 the idea that she has a childhood sweetheart, Princess Aurora, who's not a commoner. <laughs> he's, a, he's called Leo, he's the gardener, he's the, the royal gardener. They have this relationship. And so when he, uh, when she ha ha goes, gets cursed to go to sleep for 100 years, his uh, position is how can he uh, be there for her when she wakes up? So that's the question I ask myself. How a love across a hundred years, a century long love, you know. So that's where the idea of vampires came in. <laughs> so we have vampiric fairies in our piece. Um, but it came it came to me as a sort of plot thing. Because the only thing I could think of to keep yourself alive in fairy tale logic uh, for a hundred years was to get a vampire's kiss, you know. <laughs> and then you live for, forever, you know, eternal life. So our hero gives up a lot for Aurora, uh, and she has to accept it. You'll see a little clip later, actually, where he's got a little pair of wings, and she has to accept it, that he's changed when she meets him again, that he's given his life waiting for her, you know. So it's very romantic, actually. It's far more romantic. It's very romantic. Yeah. Um, and you'll see when you watch the clip, she has a, actually has a real tear coming down her face at that point when we go in close, which you can only see on the film. But, um, but it's very moving. Um, but so there was, I also invented, invented a character who's the son of uh, Carabos, who's the wicked fairy in the piece, uh, so that I could, uh, interestingly, played by the same person. So you do get a man in drag in this one. <laughs> um, so you get the same actor, dancer, playing the mother and the son. Um, and so you recognize them, basically. 
and he carries on the plot, but he becomes a, an evil suitor for Aurora, the heroine. So that sort of keeps that story going as well. But you can see what I mean. I, I try and um, ask myself questions about what works about this and what doesn't work. Sometimes it's more what doesn't work, and you come up with some new ideas. Yeah, I mean, just from hearing that, there's already a lot of surprise, a lot of, oh, really? What? Wow, that's so cool. I, could, I would love to see the vampires and just see the dynamics and yeah. Yeah, the different reactions. So this kind of brings me to my next question, which is, how? Uh, what's your thoughts on, on the con continuation of, of classical productions? Like, how, how do you see contemporary ballet going? Is it a continuation of, of the traditions, or is it some sort of subversion <laughs> or the new new things? Well, there should be room for both. You know, I think there's room for everything, and I, I, it's nice to see the classics maintained. But there's too many of them, actually. There's too many companies doing them. Um, there's too many bad productions around of very famous ballets, um, and it puts some people off. You know, because a lot of people, like I did when I was 18, I didn't. Uh, I'd never seen a ballet before, and I wanted to see uh, what was I thought was a famous ballet, Swan Lake. So I thought, I'll go and see Swan Lake, that's famous. Um, and then luckily the production I saw was very good, but if it had not been good, I would have been put off for life. I would have been like, oh, if that's Swan Lake and ballet, I'm not interested. You know? And I like, so I like, I know that a lot of people go to these very famous ballets, sometimes for the first time, and it needs to be amazing. You know, so it can be amazing, the classical version, if it's a good production. And I think what we need to do with modern audiences is give them a little bit more drama, um, keep the, the action going, you know? Don't keep stopping and starting all the time. Don't drag it out over in too long a time. Don't play the music quite so slow, you know? It's yeah, yeah, like I said, people are interested, yeah. Also, no, that's such a valid point. Um, so there are ways of still uh, doing the classical version um, and, and making it more palatable for contemporary audience, making it more exciting for contemporary audience. So it's not just the reverential ballet fans and they're keeping it very much amongst a small group of people. It should be entertaining to them. On the other hand, you can do what I do and then you do something completely different to this amazing music that was written to tell a story and to dance to. And there's no reason why that can't be different. But you do, if you're taking something that is very famous and that people love, you have to be a little bit reverential about it, as well as innovative. You you walk a tightrope between the two. So you 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 want your ideas to be different. You want the audience to have surprises in the evening. But also you want them to know that you really know and love the original piece as well. And that you're not going to mess with the music too much and that you're going to deliver something that is equally exciting or has the feeling of what that piece should be. Yeah. I'm, sure that's, I'm sure that's what you did in, in Sleeping Beauty. But, but did you change any part of the original music? Or? Well, yeah, I play, we play it at the right tempo. <laughs> <laughs> that's great! It's really interesting because most people talk to me about, oh, you're, you're you know, so daring to do all these different things with these pieces. And, um, you know, do people who love the classics get upset? Well, people who love the classics should get upset with the way that music is played now. Because it's played, as I said, so slow. Mostly to accommodate people's, you know, long extensions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it sort of takes... <laughs> Everyone wants to dance slowly to show how good they are. And it's made the music distorted. It isn't, so when we come to create all of my Tchaikovsky ballets, actually, uh, they're all played at the correct original tempo. So when you come to see one of my shows, the music is actually more authentic than the classical ballet version. Which I think is amazing, actually. Yeah, the triple yeah. tempo, you got to get it moving. Yeah, so it's a little more exciting in a way. It drives along, as Tchaikovsky intended. You know, he, was, he was brilliant, he knew what he was doing. You know? Yeah, so music plays into what you do. How does some other artistic forms such as film, we just talked a little bit about theatre, yeah. which I don't think is separable from your ballet theatre. How, how do these different things play into what you do? Well, I started off as a, uh, before I knew anything about ballet or contemporary dance, or, you know, I was, I was lucky enough to be born in London, which are parents that love theatre. So they took me to see quite a lot of theatre and you know, musicals and plays in the, in the West End of London. And, um, 
uh, a lot of films as well. You know, they were big movie fans. But we didn't know any classical music in my house. We didn't play anything like that. Um, no opera, nothing. You know, didn't know about ballet at all. So it was all that kind of thing. So I, before I, when I got into dance, I already had a lot of other interests in the arts. <coughs> Um, different kinds of music, different kinds of you know, movies, and different kinds of theatre. So I felt it's always been a bit of an advantage to me coming to dance quite late, because I, I don't really know, I didn't start training until I was 22, dancing, and um, that was um, obviously very late. Uh, but having all these experiences beforehand has really helped my choreography connect with people, I think. Because um, I'm full of images from productions I've seen, and movies, so full of, like we all are actually, we're all full of images from movies, even if we don't think about it that much. Um, why does certain things seem so significant to us? It's probably because we saw it in a movie a long time ago. You know? um, so that's all been very helpful for me, using those early loves uh, before I fell in love with serious things. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. yeah. No, that's, that's for so, so much like the major advantage is to, to your work, because it's um, it's not just about dancing, it's about matching it, not matching, but like making it, making the music, m making more sense. And, yes. and you see like the cinematography paying into the whole production and all the detail, that's really the most intriguing part. Yeah. Yeah. I think I once said one thing you uh, mentioned music again there, and I think I should say something about um, how people are hearing the music in these pieces, because we we'll just talk about the Tchaikovsky. It's very, um, it's very emotive music, you know. And one of the things that's happened on this tour of uh, Secret Beauty is a lot of people have come up to me in the audience and have said, "I was just, I found myself crying about five, ten minutes into the piece, and just because it was so, it was so beautiful, but the music was so beautiful, and it was almost like you forgot that a lot of people don't hear it." They don't go to the ballet all the time. You know, it was very new music to them, and it was sort of overwhelming. It is when you first hear it, you know. So to capture that um, real primal sort of feeling about the music, well, I thought it was a wonderful thing. That's why people are drawn to the pieces. So I think what, what happens also for um, audiences who regularly see a song of like or see is that because you've got different images with it to what you're used to seeing, you start to hear it again. Yes. And you, you, I think after a while, the experience you get of watching something is the same, the same images with the same music. You don't sort of experience it anymore. You stop hearing it, you stop watching it in a way. It sort of washes over you. Whereas this makes you listen to the music again, decide for yourself whether it works or not. You know? Yeah, and there's a certain chemistry between the music and, and your yeah. visual, yeah, the, Visual of yeah. yeah, what is happening on stage. So yeah, of course your your remaking of the classical traditions has has been ridiculously <laughs> successful, and that brings me to the thing that I always wanted to ask, which is how you balance the artistic side of things and um, the business side of things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, I do have a bit of a business mind in one way, but I do have people I work with who really do the business. You know, really <laughs> understand it more than. Yeah, the story I like to tell is when I was a small child and I used to uh, put on shows, I was always going on a show and um, always wanted to have a little company and I've always, always done that uh, all through my life. Um, but I would put on a show, say, in the garden or the, the spare bedroom at home or the, uh, and I would actually charge people to come and watch. I'd get little old ladies from down the road and bring them to my house and sit them down with a cup of tea uh, to watch my show, but I would, uh, I would ask for money. <laughs> so, uh, very, it's essential. Uh, business minded, you know. Yeah. Well, I partly felt like, well, no, we're, we're entertaining you, you have to pay for that. <laughs> you have to, you know, that's what it's all about. Um, <laughs> makes me laugh when I think about it now. But um, I sort of, in a way, I'm lucky that the kind of work that I like to do. Is, ends up being uh, quite popular, mainly because I'm very audience conscious when I make it. I, I, I don't see the point of making work for, that's not for an audience. 
And I, I know a lot of people would disagree with me on that. They would have their own viewpoint on art for art's sake, and you know, I just do it, and whether people appreciate it or not, that's up to them, and all that kind of thing. Well, I appreciate that, so that's fine. I'm not like that. I, I think of the audience when I'm making the work, and I'm making it to entertain people. So, I don't like the word commercial very much, uh, but I do like the word audience, and I do like to please audiences. I, it's not about making money to be popular. You know, commercial makes me think of money. But this is more like wanting people to like it, you know, um, not to sell tickets. Yeah, like reaching so, to a more yeah. audience. But the sideline of that is that if it has become more popular, and if we reach more people, and people want to come and see the next one. So it's like anything, if you've enjoyed something, you want to come and see that thing again, or a new production by our company or whatever. So that we, it's grown enormously. Uh, people may here may not realize that in the UK, it's sort of very, sort of phenomenally uh, successful, these pieces, in terms of dance. Not in terms of theatre. Theatre things run for a very long time in the UK, you know, for years. The dance will run for a few performances or half a week, five shows in one, that will be it, something like that. These, these pieces run for eight weeks in the West End with eight shows a week. And then they will tour for 30 weeks of the year around the country. And all the theatres we go to around the UK are theatres that have uh, plays and musicals normally and not much dance. And so we're playing to that kind of audience. Um, and it's a wonderful audience that's come to uh, trust me. They trust me to do things that they might enjoy. So now it doesn't really matter what I do. I, I can call it anything and they, they, they like the company. You know, they want to come see the company and what, what we're doing next. And they can't expect it to be different. You know, they, want to, they want a surprise. They want it to be different. Um, so, Occasionally, though, I do sort of feel I would like to really try and do something maybe that's even more experimental, or so maybe a bit more adult sometimes. You know, the main is, uh, and I have done that from time to time. You know, I've done something like Dorian Gray, The Car Man, when we made that piece, we very much intended to do something very broad and earthy and sexy and young and, you know, a bit of nudity in it. Right. You know, we were all trying to be daring, you know. Um, and uh, you know now that piece just doesn't get the same reaction it used to. People used to be shocked by it. You know, there was an uproar in the audience and things, and now it's sort of like, you know, it's another fashion show. <laughs> Bring the children. You know, um, <laughs> slightly older children. Um, so it's, uh, but even the pieces that I've tried to be a bit more daring, a bit more uh, maybe taking controversial themes. Uh, a little, but I see something being a little bit more adult that you wouldn't bring children to. Um, they've ended up becoming popular as well because I have, my instinct is to want to please people. So um, it might be for a slightly older audience sometimes, but it's still toured around the country and people like those pieces. Play without words, some other pieces you may have seen briefly, like the little clip there. It's a very weird piece with, where all the leading characters are played by two or three people at the same time. So you get different versions of the story all happening at the same time. It sounds very confusing, but it's really intriguing and people really liked it. Um, that I didn't never thought would play for more than two weeks. You know, it was an experiment, very much an experiment. Um, but it's been worth the work. Yeah, well, you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, please keep doing it. I mean, yeah, I really mean it. Um, what you just said um, reminded me of, of uh, my, my introduction to contemporary music, which was um, Pina, the, the German choreographers, um, the writer of Spring on Stravinsky's music. And that was definitely something very a daring remaking of, of, of the music. Yeah. Yeah, like with the nudity and with the, like, the violence, even. Yeah, it's a yeah. masterpiece. Yeah, that it is. Yeah. yeah. But, but also what you do kind of draws on, onto a broader audience and kind of like the kids would like to see it and where with dance is a little more remote in people's minds, like you, you will kind of raise that wall people are like, oh, that sounds familiar, that sounds yeah. interesting, I would like to yeah. get to know about it more. And that's really cool part, yeah. Yeah, I've also found the other way of, um, if we're talking about how do you win over audiences, you know, sometimes dance, people are worried about coming to dance. They think they're worried they're not going to get it. 
they're worried it's difficult to understand sometimes. So I found humor is a good way of relaxing people. So I'm hoping, because you never know <laughs> when you travel to somewhere new, you don't know what the humor's like really. It's the one thing that does separate us quite a lot of ways is humor. And you, so we have some things in our show that are expected to get laughs. Which there'll probably be silence, you know. <laughs> and then there'll be something else happens and you'll all laugh and I'll be like, what are, what are they laughing at? <laughs> What's funny? You know? So I'm expecting that a little bit. But I find that humour relaxes people because you're actually physically connected with something. Um, and often I get the you know the boyfriend who's been dragged along by the girlfriend to come to one of my shows or, or by the other way around. Or, you know. <clears throat> And then there's also maybe someone who did, you know, a friend who was like, I don't really like dance, so they you know, don't, don't get it. But come anyway. So you've got to win them over a little bit. So they, the first thing they see on stage needs to be images that really bring them in, people they understand, people, uh, characters they get. Um, and a, a, a laugh is a really precious thing. And I say to that one, to my company, I say, we missed that first laugh there. And that's so, it takes a long time then to get the audience with us. We've got to get that. That's really important, I think. Is that we, then we have the audience on, on our side. You know? So we're very conscious of that. We will be when we come here as well, very listening. I'll be in the audience listening to every sound. And like, what are they, what are they reacting to? And, you know, so I want to feel it. I want to feel what the audience feels. I remember when I first started learning English, I used this um, material called New Concept English. It's probably familiar with a lot of people here. And my, my tutor had to spend a lot of time teaching me that this is British humor. You have to get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can't force humor, can you? That's the funny thing. You, know, you really, it's you really laugh or you don't. It's, it's a real thing. That's why it's so important. That's so cool. So, before we open the ground for more questions from the audience, um, let's end this part with another three minute short clip of some exclusive insight to the Speaking Beauty. And perhaps, so Matthew, you can offer us some suggestion on how we as common audience can understand and come to appreciate your contemporary that name. <laughs> oh, yes, these are the fairies in Act One. As you can see, there are male fairies as well as females. <laughs> All with different wings. All the wings are based on different birds, actually. Um, we turn the volume up a little bit. It's a silent film. <laughs> So Baby Aurora, as you can see, is played by a puppet. She's in the cot there. She moves. She moves. <laughs> she is, look, there she is. And there is a man behind there. In, you can just see him if you look, it's his feet at the bottom. In, all in black, operating her. But it's one of those theatrical magic things where people choose not to see it, because they don't want to see it. <laughs> Here he is, and this is near the end of the production, with his little wings, Leo. This is the emotional bit, we're giving it all away. You see the tears in her eyes. This is our, after they first meet, after a hundred years of waiting. They have to get to know each other again. The dancers are not just dancers, they are actors. That's right. He's a, a sort of young vampire at this point, so his wings are quite small and he's got a little darkness around his eyes. <laughs> I promise you they do start dancing now, but it's going to cut off <laughs> before. So this is before that scene, this is a, a more contemporary section of the piece, towards the end. When well, you see the costumes are a little bit more contemporary ideas, it's not, you know, it's more modern, but also a sort of cultish feel to it. There's, there's sort of vampire, they're a vampire cult. 
And then, believe it or not, the amount to sacrifice her. It's a virgin sacrifice. So, there's a lot going on in this picture. <laughs> Would you mind telling us that she also turned into a vampire? <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, it's, I'm not going to say. Let's go and find out. Um, there's a sort of surprise ending, actually. Um, but yeah, that's the last one. There's a surprise ending. Um, So there's a lot of funny order there, so, but, um, um, yeah, you get the picture. What do you expect from your Chinese audience, <laughs> since <laughs> that, that will be the first time you personally being here? Yes, it will be the first time. I, I'm, it's my first time in China this week, actually, because I didn't come to Shanghai when uh, Swan Lake was on. So it's my first experience of being here. And I will, I'm coming back for the performances, so it will be my first time uh, experiencing a show with yeah, very exciting at this point in my life to come somewhere brand new. Uh, as we tour to a lot of the other places we've been going to quite regularly. We've been going regularly to uh, Tokyo, Japan, and to the United States, and Russia. Mm -hmm. We performed a lot in Italy, and you know, lots of places we go to regularly. Uh, but this is new for us, so it's an exciting new audience for us. That's been really interesting in Russia. <laughs> it's like when well, we say um, it's like taking coals to Newcastle, but it's a it's an expression of like taking a Russian classic back to Russia. You know, it's a little, it's a little bit scary. <laughs> but we've had the Bolshoi. We perform in Moscow usually, and uh, the Bolshoi company always come and see us, and uh, they love us. They love the acting. They're fascinated by it. And the Chekhov uh, Theatre Company come and watch us as well. They, they're, they're fascinated by the mixture of dance and acting. Uh, they find it really um, inspiring for their performances. So it's, it's nice to have those connections with other companies. You know. And who would have thought you know, that um, the Bolshoi would be um, so interested in our work that they are? Of course, I'm not surprised. So at this point, if there's any question among you guys, feel free, the precious chance. <laughs> yes, of course. Hi, welcome to China. Thank you're, you. You're as handsome as the uh, <laughs> as, as England Prime Minister. Which <laughs> one? <laughs> 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 uh, I, I have three questions. How many how many times did you get uh, did you win the Tommy Prize? And did you watch the pattern, the pattern of the opera? Did I watch it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, who gives you the inspiration to be a director of ballet? Thank you. That's three questions. <laughs> <laughs> first one was, uh, what's the first one? How many Tonys have I got? Two. I got two Tony awards for Swan Lake um, in the same night. So I got the, the choreography one first, and I was not expecting to get another one. The same <laughs> really wasn't, and that, so that was a big shock. Uh, especially as the show had already closed by that point. Very unusual for Tony Awards to even have been nominated if the show's not on, because it's all about money. <laughs> um, this is all about putting you know, money in, giving awards to shows that are currently running. Anyway, uh, what's the second question? Um, Phantom of the Opera, have I seen it? Of course I've seen it. <laughs> uh, so it was the first on about 30 years ago. Um, I'm actually involved in um, the new production of Phantom of the Opera. I, I uh, was sort of um, overseeing the production. I don't think it was the one that was here, but there's a, another touring production that goes to, is around the States. And Cameron McIntosh asked me to, to keep an eye on it. Um, uh, while he was making the Les Mis movie, the Les Miserables musical movie, he was busy. So I, I uh, stood in for him. And he, it was like a gift, because I, well, I'll take you into a secret. I, 
I, all I did was sit in a theatre for three weeks and gossip with the lighting designers. And, <laughs> and I get paid royalties on this show every week, doing virtually nothing. But anyway, I was there. Um, and the last one was, what inspired me to be a director? A director. Ballet it's just because I'm very bossy and I want to. <laughs> I like being in charge, and I'm a control freak. No, <laughs> um, I, uh, the only thing I can say, it's a big question really, but yeah, I've always done it since I was four. I've always put on a show. I've always wanted it, and I've always wanted that show to be part of a company. I've always called it a company. So whether it was groups of friends down the street where I lived, or the local church hall, or the um, youth club, I was always wanting to put on a performance and be the person in charge, and usually the star of it at that point as well. But I don't really do that anymore. But um, yeah, so it's something I've always, it's my instinct to do it. I've always done it. And I still love it, and that's the only thing I want to be doing. And I say that because I, I could have moved into musical theatre more, I could have moved into movies, I had lots of offers for movies, but, and all these things pay a lot more. But my real love is live theatre and dance, and that's what I, uh, why I still do. That's, I heard so much passion and persistence. Yeah, yeah, it's, you know, once you work so hard to get something, I don't want to lose it. You know. sure. Thank you. This lady here, Jessica Lee, uh, nice to see you in China. I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> so uh, my question is actually about casting. So as you have mentioned that you are quite bossy and you are the one in charge. So I'm just wondering how can you make sure that that one is the right person? Because that's obviously really, really important. Well, okay, only occasionally do I bring new people into the company. All the people you saw, they're, they're friends of them, my friends. You know, I've been working with them for many years. A lot of them, I mean, they're all a lot younger than the age gap gets bigger. So, um, I kind of know what roles they might be good for. So why I watch them in this show, for Sweeping Beauty, I'm thinking about the next show, and I think, oh, so this person would be good in that role. And, you know, um, and I do take new people into the company. But we do have auditions every year, and I look for people who are um, passionate about moving and also generous with their personality, generous with audiences, wanting to give, you know, because they, they, although they may not be trained actors, which most of them are not, they, uh, that, that generosity of spirit is very, is the beginnings of acting in a way, of them wanting to tell the, the story to the audience. Um, the other thing I, I try is to get a bit, as big a diversity of the, in, in my company as possible, shapes and sizes, different races, you know, any, as a different group of people as I can find uh, that are talented at that time. Because I, when you're telling stories, you need everyone to not look the same. You know, because the world isn't like that. <laughs> so um, that's important to me as well. Uh, I see the first hand up there. Yeah. Hi, hi. Um, you know, uh, uh, when, when I heard you say you haven't, uh, you have never uh, watched ballet before 18, so that makes me, you know, uh, brave enough to stand, stand up saying that I'm not very familiar with about uh, ballet either. Uh, but anyway, I, I watched a show about Swan Lake uh, 19 something, so uh, I'm pretty not too bad. <laughs> um, oh, well, all right. Um, I, I'm curious about your. Um, What's, what's your way in your mind about whether you can make money about a new show or are you just uh, driven by your enthusiasm about your uh, art, about the, the dance itself? Yeah. So, uh, uh, not necessarily uh, the, the commentary from about the art itself is successful, successful and means that financially the show will be successful. Yeah. So well, what's your way in your mind? Well, I don't think about money when I'm thinking about a show. It doesn't really come into my head, you know, because um, I know that, you know, if I do it, I'll, I, I'll be okay, you know. As long as I'm okay, I'll get by, you know. Um, so it's not my first thought. But I have to, 
I have to, more importantly, I have to make sure that we can pay all our dancers, we can pay everyone that's working on the show. So the show has to be made to be the sort of piece that audiences are going to want to come and pay to see, so that we can pay everyone. You know, so the, the, those sort of considerations become, it's not about me, it's more about everyone. Um, so, you know, those things can, they, they do become important. Um, but as I said, I kind of do that kind of work anyway, so I'm not really um, having to do things that I don't want to be doing to survive, you know? Uh, really, I'm lucky in that respect, you know, I'm very lucky. Um, but as I say, you know, there are things that, like, for example, now in my country, I think a lot of young dancers and choreographers, they almost refuse to work for nothing. They, they say, I'm not going to work and not pay my dancers, you know. I'm gonna, I, if I'm going to work, I need to be paid properly to do it. Which is fair enough argument. But all I can say is that at the beginning of my company, I, I had a part-time job for the first five or six years of that company. Uh, and all my dancers did. And they weren't paid very much. They weren't paid a proper wage. They were, it was sort of a share out of what we did make. But it was much more of a passion for doing it. I'm not saying that's right. But to get started and to get seen and to get um, noticed in some way is quite difficult. So you, you're not going to get lots of money to do what you want to do. Uh, you have to work with, within small means to make something happen and to try and get noticed. Um, then it starts to work after a while. It did start to work after a while, and we can start paying people a proper wage, and that's got better as time's gone by, and we look after people better because we can afford to get a physio in to look after them. And, you know, more things can be done to make everything, and now it's great, you know, we're a great company to work for now, but it's taken a while to get to that point, you know. So what I'm saying is, you know, sometimes you have to um, suffer a little bit early on. <laughs> Very much. Yeah. yeah, I think it's it's not always about right or wrong, but it's uh, something you need to find something that's true for you to do something. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Hi, sir. I'm very yeah, glad to hear you talk about your ideas and your work. So I have two questions, and my first question is that um, you just said that you prefer live theater to like film productions. Yeah. Um, I just want to know how you think about these two kinds of um, like forms. Yeah. Like, what do you think are, are the advantages and disadvantages, and why you think live theater is better? Okay. So um, for me, live theater is um, interaction. You know, it's the interaction between the performers and the audience, and, uh, and it's different every show, different every night. Also, I can go in the next day and fix something that, you know, make it better the next day, whereas with film, you can't do that once it's shot, you know, that's that. Um, I like having that time period where you can keep working on something, you know, where it's a very um, uh, organic, uh, movable feast, we call it, sort of something that's uh, um, very adaptable and changeable, and I have new ideas about it. And it's exciting because every night you get this lovely reaction from people, you know, so it's a very real thing. Film is quite boring, it's slow, <laughs> it's, you don't really see it, you know, until later. I mean, you ask any actor, and, you know, they go and watch the films they've been in, they can't believe what they're seeing, but they never really felt part of that when they were making it. It's a different thing. Also, most actors will say, I can't watch it, or I wish I'd done that, or you know, they're never really that happy. I mean, um, we had to, Johnny Depp actually came to see my production of Edward Scissorhands, and he never watched the film. So it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, he watched the show, but not the film. He was crying when he watched the show. Because uh, it brought back lovely memories and stuff, but he didn't want to see it, you know? Um, so something about film is very cold, apart from when you're in the audience enjoying a great film, and you're, that's what I like. I, I love film, but I like to let other people make them. And I, I'd be happy to sit and, to, and watch them, you know. I don't want to make them necessarily. Thank you. And my second question is, like, what is more exciting for you, 
being a playwright who writes stories or like directing the story? Like, in other words, do you like to make up a story or like presenting the story on stage? Um, I do enjoy both, you know, equally, I think. I, I, I love uh, that time where it's just me trying to create a story. Uh, and Because uh, it feels like the, the thing I do the least, in a way. It's, it's, it's always, it doesn't come around very often. I'm not writing all the time. I just, every few years, I write a story for a show, you know, and it, that becomes a new challenge, you know, I enjoy it. But, um, but directing is something I do all the time, because I'm always directing the shows or new performers in it or giving out new ideas. So it's um, more, um, I suppose I enjoy the, the writing bit more <coughs> because I do it less, you know, it's a rarer thing. So I always get very excited by it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your sharing. Uh, I find it very interesting and inspiring. Um, so uh, there, are, there are a lot of uh, con contemporary ballet companies or dancing companies around the world. Um, and apparently there are many uh, of them that are not successful or popular as your company. So my question is that I really wonder uh, what do you think is the key factor that differentiate your company uh, to your peer group? Mm. Thank you. <laughs> well, I don't really know, to be honest, but I will say that um, <laughs> um, maybe people should ask, you know, people should ask themselves, um, if we've managed to get people to come and see our show, that's amazing, you know, that we've got them to buy a ticket and come and watch. Now, our next job is to make sure they want to come back again, you know, to come to see us again. Um, so that's very important. So you've got to do something that really is like, not just, oh, it's a show, people come, don't they? They buy tickets. People, um, I had a, I'll tell you a couple of stories about that. Um, a young choreographer friend of mine um, did a tweet on, um, he, he played this venue in Plymouth, you might have seen it, and it was sold out the first year. It was only a very small theatre, it's 80 people, but it's sold out. They went back the year after, and he's tweeting, where are you, Plymouth? You know, last year we were sold out. Well, I think, well, that's telling you something. You were sold out one year, the next year no one comes. <laughs> What's that telling you? You know, it's, so it's sort of, a, it, it was more like, oh, well, the publicity was bad, or something like that. You would think it's that. You've got to grab people. You've got to make people want to come, want to come back, you know. Um, there was a, I did a talk recently for a group of uh, young choreographers at, Place, which is a contemporary dance school in London, and the, the theme was um, about how can you make your work more popular, how can you engage an audience and things like this, and I came in to talk about it because people think that you know, my stuff's popular, so they always want to know why. And I said to them, okay, I said, the first thing I think of, every morning when I wake up, the first thing I think of is how can I sell tickets to <laughs> like, what tweet can I put on? Like, uh, what's, what, how can I do a, a photo on social media or something that's going to excite people? And they go, like, really? Well, don't you have people who do that for you? You know, do, why? And I said, yes, I do. I said, but nobody cares about your work as much as you do, actually. Nobody you employ is going to wake up first thing in the morning and think, how can I? So you've got to get engaged yourself. That's what I'd say to those people. You know, so, I think there's a lot of factors actually, but I think that's a big one. Is, um, you know, it is about people parting with their money. It comes down to that. It comes down to people wanting to see it enough to give some of their hard-earned money for a ticket to come and see it. And that's, that's going to be a good, strong reason you know, to come. That's why some companies don't succeed. Because you might even come and go, yeah, this is quite good, I quite liked it, it's nice, it's good. That doesn't mean you want to come back. You've got to come out thinking, wow, that was amazing, I loved it. When are they coming back? You know, what's, what else do they do? You know, that's what you've got to feel. Then you want to part with your money and you want to see it. Um, I just want to ask, are there anything that sort of involves contemporary audiences? You, they seem to be like a, uh, how would you say, a push towards more nudity, more sex and more violence. Do you feel any sort of pressure to sort of include that? Or does that run through your mind when you're making you know, 
through making classical ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Does it run through my mind? So you have more unity vibes. <laughs> 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 Right. Oh, also, I mean, is there any sort of boundaries that you would not cross sort of? Yes, well, boundaries is an important thing. I've always, uh, I have pushed the boundaries a little bit here and there, but I've done it in a way that I feel I've used judgment with it. We do, in, in our production of the Carmen, that we do have a little bit of full frontal male nudity. But it's done, it's done, um, it's, it's sort of done, it's such a fun thing that people sort of scream a bit. And they all giggle, and, and it's over very quickly. It's basically uh, two guys who just you know, they, all the mechanics have a shower, and they sort of tap on their towels, you know, and they're sort of laughing with each other, and and then they just turn around quickly and throw the towel over their shoulders, and the whole audience screams, and they go off. It's like really quick. <laughs> and it actually really well. Like, rather than shock anyone, it just relaxes them. They want just like laugh essentially. It's the context. You know, the context of it um, is the important thing. It's fun. That, in that context, it's fun. Um, if they were to come out and just sort of stand there, you know, <laughs> <laughs> front, you know so the audience starts to do that. You know, you know, they don't react in the same way. They're sort of like unco really uncomfortable. So it's, the, it's, it's how you do it. So but, you know, sort of like Game of Thrones. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, you know, I don't make those things, so I don't. I, I can only talk about what I do. And I, I think we have had, you know, violence in pieces. We, I, I was one of the first people to actually have, you know, if someone got stabbed or shot, there was blood, you know, because I felt we were trying to tell a realistic story. Often, in, you know, Giselle's supposed to put a knife in herself, a sword at one point, you know, there's never any blood. Why not, actually, now, today, you know, you want to feel something for her, you feel how awful that is, you know, she's actually done that. And um, so I think in the right context, it can really add to something, but it is to do with context, you know, not just for the sake of it. Thank you. I was wondering why you pay so much attention to details. Like you mentioned it, that in the video clip of the Mewty, um the wings of the fairies are all made of different bird species. Yeah. But I wonder that like the audience couldn't really distinguish the difference between the winds, wings. Mm. Um, but why do you make it? Like, will there be any different impact on the audience if you make them into the same species? Well, it's a design thing in a way, the detail. Um, it, I, it's not important. It's not important for the audience to know that or get that. It's important to the dancers that they're individual. So all those costumes are very detailed and very different. So they think that's I, that's me, that's my fairy, that's my they're my wings, and I'm not the same as that someone else who does it. And they all have their own costume and their own wings, even if they're doing other. Parts of them. So it makes the performer feel really uh, unique. Um, and our designer, Les Brotherston, has a theory about detail and costume. For example, uh, Aurora's corset that she wears for quite a lot of the show, um, when you go very close to it, in between all the, the, all the, um, we call it the bone, the bones or the lines of the corset, a tiny little red roses green leaves and red roses, because her big theme is roses, you know, she's all about uh, Rosa and Dargio and sort of thing. And no one in the audience is going to see that, you can't see it. But it makes her feel better, because she feels that that course has been made for that character, it relates to her character. And here's what Les says, it says, the, the, the audience can't see all the detail, but they can feel it. And it's so true, actually. I've seen a show with costumes that are sort of quite nicely done, but not much on them, not much detail. And it looks cheap. When you, when you look at those fairy costumes, and it looks like it, you know, it looks like someone's gone to a lot of trouble to make those costumes so different, and the colours, and the, you know, you feel like this is a, this is beautiful, this is amazing. Even if you can't see it all, you know, I mean, they are worth seeing close up because they are so amazing. All of them are also different. But so it's, I think he's right, you can 
feel it in the audience, even if you can't see it in all that detail. So I think it's, I think it's an important thing. I believe in it as well. I believe in what he says as a designer. Is that what you meant? Design detail? Yeah. 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 Hello. Hi. Hi. Excuse me. And one thing I'm very curious about is, uh, have you tried to let your words perform outside, not on stage? Outside? Yes. Uh, that's what we'd like. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Um, <laughs> it rains a lot in where I come from. Um, <laughs> um, we have sort of thought about doing the car man outside because it doesn't have much flying in it. A lot of our sets have flying, so we need we need uh, we need the tower, you know, to fly our sets in and out. So some of the shows don't work really without the set. Car man, we could do. We have talked about doing outdoor theatres in Italy, uh, it would be fantastic. We'd love it actually. Uh, it would be wonderful. But um, why do you ask? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a modern dancer, and uh, modern dancer is a lot of work. Uh, we like to um, improve improvisation in the outside. Okay. Yeah, sounds nice. Like it. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't really work for these big shows, but you know, I like the idea of it. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hi, sir. Um, my question is, uh, when you were doing the uh, remake, uh, when you, you, you were uh, doing the remake of the, of the classical IP, uh, what's your uh, criteria uh, in terms of picking the pieces? Uh, I noticed there are a lot of Tchaikovsky, it's the music that inspired you or compelled you to uh, do a remake or the story, those classical stories themselves. Uh, and, and going forward, um, will, will these uh, criteria be, uh, evolve or change over time? Yeah, Thank you. well it's interesting here because we're, we're very new in our life here in China and we're introducing Chinese audiences to our work. And so I focus very much on the Tchaikovsky works here. Um, but of course, Sword Sor Maid was 21 years ago and Nutcracker was before that. And Sin Beauty was the most recent piece. There's a lot of pieces in between that where we have had to think of different ways of being inspired to make pieces because there's only three Tchaikovsky ballets, and I've uh, done Cinderella and Prokofiev, which is wonderful. Um, so there's not that many great ballet scores, you know, there's a few, but not an enormous amount left to do. Uh, so we've had to look to films, um, Edward Scissorhands, a film called The Servant, as well, we basically that words on. Our latest piece that's coming up later this year is based on a film, The Red Shoes. Um, we've done a piece based on opera, you know, the, Carmen, opera music. Um, we've also done a piece based on a book, Doreen Correct. So um, our pieces are, um, we can't just stick with famous ballads. You know, we have to have other uh, source material. So when it is a famous score, the music is very, very much the guideline for, for uh, inspiration and the reason for doing the piece. So I really wanted to do the Prokofiev after I've done the Tchaikovsky. I really love that score. I want to interpret that score. Um, and it's, the score for me is like a script that tells me what to do, you know. Uh, whereas some of our pieces have had brand new scores, so that inspiration has come in a different way. It's a, it's a kind of music, or, and, you know, sometimes I haven't got the music, so it's been a, a different kind of inspiration. So, um, each piece is a, a different experience and a different kind of inspiration, but music is always the best kind of inspiration, really, because that, that's the thing that makes you want to feel and, and dance and do something. It's easy, though. Doing CD Beauty was very easy for me because I just loved the music so much. I just, it was a pleasure to come into work every day, to work with it. What do you do, Giselle? Um, Going forward. Giselle, yeah, I don't, I've done a piece. Yeah, I, suppose, <laughs> I do love Giselle. I think it's the perfect ballet. I think it always works. Um, but I, I've done a piece called Highland Fling uh, between Nutcracker and Swan Lake, which was based on La Sylphie. So it had sort of silky things in it, and uh, I used a lot of Giselle's inspiration for that piece. So I sort of feel I've done it a little bit a long time ago. And the Scottish ballet performed that piece now. 
Um, and it had, it did have aspects of Giselle in it, but I would kind of wish I had in a way. I'd love to do Giselle one day, maybe. Hello. Um, Very um, Thanks for sharing your ideas about your uh, productions in China. This is the first time I believe you you've been here, right? Yeah.
But now, I work in a, a foreign bank. Uh, I change from the art sector to finance industry. So I know uh, uh, for the, 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 the people who pay uh, for the uh, theater to support financially, uh, their character, their kind, their way of thinking is totally, sometimes it's, I can see it's totally different from the artist, from the people who create something. So I think that uh, you are a successful artist, and you are a, also a successful businessman. How could you uh, get your success to these two kind of uh, parts that balance quite well? Thank you. Yes, well, let's <laughs> talk about it a bit. I mean, uh, it comes down to a really simple thing, actually, ultimately, but this is being a bit um, blasé in some way, but is you can only be successful if you're giving people something they want. You know, if, you, if you're not, then you're not successful. So it's not strictly true always, actually. But the, the basis of, of um, business and uh, art is that, you know, I don't, I don't think I'm a successful businessman. I just do piece, pieces that I want people to enjoy, and luckily they do, do mostly. And then the business becomes because of that. You know, so, um, it do, some artists feel they deserve support just for being an artist. And I don't necessarily believe in that. I think but you've got to give something. A lot of artists, they are quite self-conscious. Yeah. Well, I was going to say the other side of it, really, is that um, I do think we lose a lot of great artists, and certainly choreographers that I know, that are big, big, little, little geniuses, you know, what they've done. But they've never had the lucky break, they've never had the opportunity it's a very expensive, in my particular profession, it's very expensive if you, you, to, you've got to hire space, you've got to have work with people. You can't do it on your own, you can't paint, you can't write, you know, you have to have other people to do it. Uh, so it's very expensive. So you lose a lot of very talented people along the way, and that's maybe what you're talking about in a way. You can, to, you can lose some very talented people. And that's because they don't get the chance. Uh, and I maybe had some lucky breaks along the way. So. It's a bit of both, you know, you, it's, the, the thing for me actually that's important is getting yourself noticed somehow early on. It becomes a really big issue and a really important one. Because once you've established yourself a little bit, you can then do all sorts of things. And you can do less controversial pieces, and let, you know, let people still enjoy it. Something controversial actually really does get you noticed a bit to begin with, but there's no point in doing it if that's not really you. It's not coming from you. Because then you're never going to repeat it, you know. So it's a high, it's a tough one. Really. It's, uh, there's no sort of easy answer to it. You have to be a bit brave and do something that, that's from your from the heart. Uh, don't follow the trends. People often think that to be successful, you have, you should like what's popular at the moment. What do people like? You know, what's the thing everyone likes? I'll do that. You know, actually, that's the thing not to do because everyone's it's already happening. Do something else. Hmm? Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. So it's, it's not an easy answer. Yeah, one final question. One final question. <laughs> My final question in, in, in China. <laughs> Tomorrow morning. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, actually, I saw a lot of dancing, dancing drama in the past 10 years, and uh, it's the first time I saw you transfer the classic dancing to the contemporary dancing. It's very, I'm very impressed. It's very interesting. My question is, I just wonder uh, from the dancers, the point of view, the skill side, whether the skill, is there any difference for the skill side or the gift that when you recruit the dancers, when you can... What sort of skills are required? 
Yes, as, as I understand, yeah. you know, the, the classic is very standard, but yeah. the contemporary ones are different. But for, for yours, mm -hmm. you transfer from the ballet, it's still some kind of ballet. I just wonder yeah. whether the same, same dancers could transfer from the classic ones. Uh, some of them can. Well, uh, the thing is, all contemporary training has ballet as part of it. So if you're doing a contemporary dance training, you do a ballet class every day and a contemporary so it's the basis of a lot of training. So some of the dancers that I work with can go between a classical company and a contemporary company. Some of them do musical theatre, some of them sing. So I, I've got um, a real mixture in my company. It's not one style. You know? So their training, their main training is dance, be it classical, contemporary, or musical theatre. And there's a real mix of that. The thing they're not trained in is acting. And very few of them had acting experience. So that's the thing they have to learn to do in these productions. Um, they have to learn to act. And the way to get them to act is to think truthfully. And they have to find it in themselves. Um, and because they haven't got any skill set, as actors do, to find those things. So it has to be very honest, actually. And they do get very involved in their characters. And that's, um, so this, their main skill set is dance. And I think dance is a good way of um, referring to all dance. I think I, I like to think of people being great dancers, not great ballet dancers or great contemporary dancers or whatever. You know, I think if you're a great dancer, you can do, but you can turn your hand to virtually anything, and that's what people need to be today, versatile. Because the you know the contemporary choreographers are working with the ballet companies, the ballet companies. If you can't be into a classical ballet company, sometimes you need to work. You need to work elsewhere, you know. So people need to be very versatile in their styles. Um, but that's um, a good thing. If anyone here is a dancer, I know there's not, not that many dancers here. Be versatile, you know, try everything. Because that's so that's the important cool thing today, I think. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So once again, thank you so much for coming out. Oh, <laughs> 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 <laughs>